So today's lecture 16, and the title of this lecture is A Grand Tour of the Galaxy. So the idea here is we're going to start actually exploring what it is we know about our galaxy, uh, its size, flying through it, and getting a sense of what it looks like from the outside and its local environment. This is a really cool image. It's, it's one of these panoramas of the Milky Way. This is actually taken from the southern hemisphere in Chile. So the Milky Way it looks really, really cool in the southern hemisphere. And that's because in the southern hemisphere, the Earth is, uh, you're seeing a part of the galaxy that you actually can't see from the north. You really can't see the middle of the galaxy. And you can see a few other things up there in the sky that you, you can't see in the north. And I'll, come, I'll return to this later, but these two things right here are actually other galaxies. They're called the small and the large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, who has seen the Milky Way? Who's been to a place where it's actually dark enough and the skies are clear that you can see it? Wow. So who has not seen it? You need to go camping. You need to go out. <laughs> get out. Get out where away from the away from the lights when it's clear. You know, if you're out at night at Joshua Tree, you can see it. It's not that far away. Okay? It's beautiful, though. If you've seen it, the people who've seen it can tell you all about how wonderful it is. Uh, but it used to be people living, you know, just a couple hundred years ago, right? Everybody saw it. Okay? As long as it was clear, you could see it, and it, dominate, it would sort of dominate the sky in this milky band that would stretch overhead like this all the way around. And in fact, as far as we can tell, you know, most cultures, all cultures have named it. And the name Milky Way sort of makes sense for us, right? So uh, in Greek, it was basically called Milky Band uh, in ancient Greek. So in, in Latin, it was Via Lactea, which is the road of milk. Um, in Chinese, the translation is something like Silver River. And so in a lot of these, a lot of different cultures, it was sort of associated with a road or a band, or something like that in the sky. And that's kind of what it looks like. So this is what we see. This is another really awesome image of the Milky Way. This is taken from Easter Island. And I love this because you see these sort of ancient statues there in the foreground. And you can imagine people living on Easter Island, you know, a thousand years ago or something, looking up and seeing a night sky that's not that much different than this. Because Easter Island's in the southern hemisphere, you can also see these Magellanic clouds. But when we look up into the sky at night and it's dark enough and clear enough, so when I say we, I mean the four of you who have seen it, <laughs> uh, you should really try to see it, uh, you see a band like this. But what's really going on is we live in this crazy giant disk of stars and we're sitting out here at the edge. And as I talked about last time, what we're, what we're seeing is we're embedded within this disk and we look, when you look along the path of the disk, all the light piles up and it looks this way. But when you look away from the path where the disk is, if you look up out of the disk, there aren't as many stars to look through and it looks basically empty. But it's important to keep in mind that every single star you can see by eye is in the Milky Way. Everything, out, everything you see in the sky, every single star you can see is in our Milky Way galaxy. Our Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. This is very big, right? It takes light eight minutes to get to us from the sun. It would take light 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way. So it's a big, big thing. Um, there are about 6,000 stars all over the world that you can see by eye. That's how many stars there are that you can see. So when you think about, you know, there's sort of this idea where you go up on a starry night and you sort of think, wow, there are countless stars. There really aren't countless stars that you could see. If you really wanted to and you had a lot of time on your hands, you could count them all, right, the ones you could see. There's just a few thousand. Um, the most distant one that you could basically see by eye is about 4,000 light years away. That thing is a crazy bright star that you can see it from that far away. Most of the stars you can see by eye are not even anywhere close to that far away. But keep in mind, even if the most distant one of these 6,000 is 4,000 light years away, 4,000, the whole Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. So it's very, very big. In fact, every single star you can see by eye at night is in that bubble. And there are a lot of stars you can't see 
that are in that bubble because they're just too dim to see within that bubble. But there are many, many more outside that bubble that are just too far away to see, no matter how bright they are. And because there's gas and dust in the way that absorbs their light. So there's 6,000 stars you could see by eye. There are, are something like 200 billion stars in the galaxy. That really is uncountable, okay? You could take a lot of time counting and you're not gonna get there. So even though, you know, take that sort of sense of awe you've had on a, on a dark night looking up at the sky and seeing all those stars, that is nothing compared to the number of stars there actually are in our galaxy. Yeah? And what would be able to figure out that there were like 200 billion stars? Um, I'll talk a bit more about that. In fact, in this lecture, I'll, I'll move in that direction. But basically, it goes like this. Uh, we have a sense of how big our galaxy is from deep counts of stars with big telescopes in certain directions, okay? And so, and we have a sense of the symmetry of our galaxy. And we've gotten a sense of how, what it's like on the other side by using different wavelength light besides visible light. And so what, what, we, what we've basically done, and, and again, when I say we, I mean it's sort of hundreds and hundreds of PhD theses worth of work, right? So when you say, how did we figure it out? It's like lots and lots and lots of work over time have put this together. But basically it's, you figure out along key directions where you have a lot of telescope data, you count stars along these directions, and you just begin to see how many stars there are in that direction, that direction, and that direction. You understand that at least locally where we can have really good surveys of how many faint stars and how many bright stars there are, how many small stars there are compared to big ones, okay? So if you can only see the brightest stars from over here, you know that at least by surveying our local environment for every, bite, every one bright star, there might be 5,000 dimmer stars. And so by piecing, piecing together ratios like that, you can end up coming up with a reasonable estimate of how many total stars there are. There are other ways you can do it dynamically too by measuring how fast stars are moving. That gives you a sense of how much mass there is in stars kicking each other around. But it's a, an extreme amount of work. You know, when I just sort of toss off, and you, you were sort of sensitive to this, when I toss off, oh, there's about 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, that's an extreme amount of work that's gone into us being able to actually say that. So it's amazing that we know it. And it's basically been the work of many, many, many PhD theses over the last 100 years that have allowed us to sort of piece that together. And modern sky surveys that are going on right now are continuing to inform that, that picture. So it turns out that our picture of the Milky Way is constantly evolving. And even every year, we learn something new about even the own, our own galaxy that we're sitting within. Okay. Okay. Uh, other questions? Very good question. So here's a, you know, another view, another one of these artists' impressions of the Milky Way. And again, let me remind you, this is not a real picture of the Milky Way. We can't fly a spaceship up 100,000 light years above the Milky Way and take a picture. That's not happening. But we've managed to piece together what we think the Milky Way is like uh, by doing a lot of careful surveys and a lot of different wavelength bands, et cetera. So the sun is about, it, there, here's the middle of our galaxy. It's brighter in the middle and gets dimmer in the outer part. And this middle part is broadly called the bulge. And the rest of it is called the disk. And the other thing that's very prominent and kind of iconic about our galaxy and many other galaxies is that it has these spiral arms that are spiraling out like this. These spiral arms are uh, where gas has piled up. And within those spiral arms, a lot of new stars are being formed, so they're very bright. Um, now, the galaxy is actually spinning like this. So the sun, in fact, is going around our galaxy at about 200 kilometers a second. So it's orbiting around the middle. So much like the Earth is orbiting around the sun, the sun is orbiting around the middle of our galaxy. And it's because of this orbit, that's in fact why the galaxy is a disk. So it turns out that if you have any kind of system that has a little bit of spin, has a little bit of angular momentum, and the system loses some energy, the lowest energy configuration that thing can be in is in a disk, is in a thin disk that's kind of spinning coherently in one direction. And that's what our galaxy disk looks like. That's why planets tend to form in a plane around a star 
and that's a, that's a thing you'll generally see. Now the sun, the, the galaxy, even though this, sorry, so even though the sun is going really fast, 200 kilometers a second, it actually takes 200 million years for it to go around the galaxy once. So every 200 million years, we've orbited the galaxy one time. Um, and the reason why it takes so long is because it's very big. Okay. Now the other thing that is kind of cool here is, so the sun's moving around like that and you see these spiral arms that are wound up like this. It turns out that those things are not spinning around. They're not actually physical features that move, they're waves. So there's something called a density wave. So in the disk there's all this gas and dust and in certain places it's piled up into one place. So if you imagine the disk of our galaxy were perfectly smooth and at one point you get a little pile up, imagine that pile up kind of propagating through the disk as sort of a density wave. In just the same way that if you have a line of traffic, you know, cars are all driving in the road and somebody stops, you know, someone jumps out in front of traffic so you put your brakes on and stop, the car behind you stops, the car behind them stops and it backs up, that stopping point backs up. Now, even after the person who initially first stopped has started to go again, that traffic pileup is still propagating behind them like a wave. Okay, does that make sense? So traffic pileups sort of propagate like waves too on the freeway. And the same kind of thing is happening in our galaxy. This is a pileup of gas that's kind of propagating around the galaxy in a certain way, even though the stars are not necessarily moving within them. So the sun is currently sort of at the edge of one of these spiral arms, but it's going to move out of it and into another one and out of it and into another one. So the stars are not necessarily staying fixed in those spiral arms. Those spiral arms are propagating like waves around the disk. Okay. Are there any questions about this? This is a real galaxy. This is not a picture, but it's called, it's called NGC 6744. Uh, and it's a good guess of what the Milky Way would like, look like if we could fly 30 million light years from it and take a picture of it. Milky Way probably looks something kind of like this and the Earth slash Sun would be somewhere like here. Okay. Are there any questions about this? You see this thing here? Does anyone know what this is? Any guesses? Sorry? You could say it. Supernovae? It'd be cool if it was. It's not, uh, but it would be cool. This is just a star. Now, it's not a star that's part of this galaxy. It's a star that's in between us and that galaxy. Because in order for us to take pictures of other distant galaxies, we've got to look through our own galaxy. And our galaxy has all kinds of stars in it. So a lot of times when you see pictures like this, a lot of these single point things here are actually stars in the foreground in our galaxy that we have to look through in order to see this single galaxy that's very far away. Does that make sense? So a lot of times when you see really pretty astronomical images like that, you'll see stuff that looks like this in the picture. Those are usually stars that are in front of it that just look really bright. You know, it's like trying to take a picture of something far away and someone's got a candle in your field of view kind of messing it up. Okay, questions about this? Okay, so here's our galaxy again. Um, about 200 billion stars. Now most of the stars in the Milky Way are so-called red dwarf stars. They're little. Most stars are little. There are way more small stars than there are, are big stars. Uh, only about 7% of the stars in our galaxy are really like the sun. A lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, the sun is a typical star and a typical galaxy, blah, blah, blah. That's not true. The sun is not a typical star. It's just a fact. The sun is more massive than a typical star. Most stars are smaller than the sun. Actually, in a tiny, tiny fraction of the stars are actually more massive than the sun and they shine blue. Okay? So these little stars are red. Why are little stars red? Anybody know? You should know this. What? Great. They're low temperature. So low mass stars don't shine very brightly. The, the peak emission of your black body spectrum has to do with how hot you are. 
And the cooler you are, the longer wavelength light you, grow, you glow in. So these cool low mass stars glow red. Very hot high mass stars glow blue. And the sun is sort of in the middle and it's kind of yellow. In the middle. Okay? Here are our, here's our neighbor, Proxima Centauri. There's a, the nearest star to the sun is called Proxima Centauri. It's 4.25 light years away. So if we wanted to send uh, a mission to the very nearest star, our very nearest friend, this star is 4.25 light years away. Uh, and this is how far we'd have to send something. Now, this thing is actually, even though it's the closest star to the sun, you cannot see it with your naked eye. It's not bright enough. It's too far away. It's one of these dwarf stars. So like most stars in the galaxy, it's teeny tiny. It's not very bright. And even though it's only four light years away, you actually can't see it. It's 100 times fainter than what you could see with your naked eye. To give you a sense of how far away this star is, if you took the sun and you shrunk it down to the size of a golf ball, Proxima Centauri would be the size of a marble in Clearwater, Florida. Okay, so it would be 2,500 kilometers away. That's the nearest star to the sun. So this is supposed to, you know, hit you over the head with the fact that the galaxy is actually a pretty empty place. And the sun is pretty lonely, you know, if it wants another star to hang out with. It doesn't have anybody nearby. It would take 100,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri in our fastest spaceships right now. <clears throat> it turns out, actually, that Proxima Centauri is bound to another pair of, pair of stars, Alpha Centauri. So there's a pair of stars that are, that are binary that are pretty close to each other, orbiting around each other, called Alpha Centauri A and B. They're actually both about the size of the sun. They're, about, they're very similar to the sun. And uh, they're orbiting around each other. And then this star Proxima Centauri is kind of far away from it, and we think it's also bound. So it's this triplet system that are all orbiting around each other. Um, Alpha Centauri, or sorry, um, Proxima Centauri, like I said, is 4.24 light years away. And this thing, uh, this pair, Alpha Centauri pair, is 4.37 light years away. They're separated by 11 AU, so 11 astronomical units. So if you think about how far the Earth is from the Sun, this pair is 11 times farther than that, orbiting around each other. And then another 8,000 AU away, this other thing is orbiting around. And this fact that the nearest stars to us are actually orbiting each other is not that weird. As we've studied more stars in the galaxy, we find that a good fraction of the stars out there are actually in multiples, either binaries or triplets or something like that. Binary stars are actually really common. So a lot of stars are born or end up living in pairs orbiting around each other. Uh, so this is now out to 30 light years. So those stars are all within about five light years. If you put the sun in the middle, this is a map of all the kind of brightish stars within 30 light years. Um, within 15 light years of the sun, there are 56 stars. But there are only 38 systems. Okay, so a lot of these are multiples. There's 24 single stars, 10 binary systems, 4 triplet systems. So the majority of the stars right around us are in these multiples. So that's just what's typical. Are there any questions about this? Um, another thing just to kind of keep in the back of your mind, uh, stars are about six light years apart on average. So if you, if you take a star and you ask how far is the nearest star, about six light years away. That's just typical. Um, and most of the stars out here where the sun is uh, are about four and a half billion years old. And that's the age of the sun. Okay, so we are typical in the sense that we're about typical age. The separation of stars around us is pretty typical. Now, if you go to the middle of the galaxy in this bulge region that I was talking about before, their things are different. Most of the stars that live in the middle of the galaxy are old. Okay, most of those stars are like 10 billion years old. So twice as old as the sun. 
Moreover, it's a little bit tighter, more tightly packed in there and those stars are about half a light year apart. So they're kind of crammed together in a tight ball and they're older. And we think that, you know, I mean we know that the stars in here formed much, much earlier than the stars out here and so we have this basic picture that the galaxy grew over time from the inside out. So 10 billion years ago it was mostly growing in the middle here and over time that disk formed. And the detailed process of that is something that we're still trying to work out, but that's, that's sort of a basic picture that we see. Are there any questions about this? The total mass of stars in the disk is about 10 to the 11 times that of the sun. Okay, so again, that's, that's 100 billion. So roughly 100 billion times the mass of the sun, that's how much mass there is in the disk. There's about 10 times less than that in this middle ball. The middle ball is about 10 billion times the mass of the sun. Any questions about this? All right, so here we are again. We're out here, this kind of spiral arm. So what we're beginning to realize now is that the sun is one star, okay, in a galaxy that contains more than 100 billion other stars. And we're also in a galaxy, or sorry, we're, our galaxy is one among another 100 billion or so other galaxies in the observable universe. So 200 billion stars in our galaxy, roughly 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So a lot of times when you hear this, you feel insignificant. Does that make anyone feel insignificant? Okay. So here's another way to look at it. Uh, you are a member of the species who figured this out. Okay. You live in this little bubble. Okay. Our solar system is the size of a maple leaf compared to the Pacific Ocean of our galaxy. Our world is microscopic on that scale. And our species has existed for about 100,000 years, which is really sort of a blink of the eye compared to the age of our galaxy. So the fact that we've been able to do this is actually kind of impressive. So don't let it make you feel insignificant. You are significant. You're very significant compared to all this other stuff we know about here. As far as we know, we're the only ones being significant. <laughs> now, we may have friends over here who disagree with us, but we'll deal with that later, right? Okay. So here's this picture of the night sky I showed you before from Easter Island. And as I mentioned, you can go to the, if you've been to a really dark place in the southern hemisphere, and you look up at the night sky, not only will you see this gorgeous band of the Milky Way that looks even more awesome, by the way, down there than it does from here, but you'll see these things in the sky that look like clouds. And these are actually other galaxies. They look like, by eye, it looks like the Milky Way kind of broke into pieces and there's a couple other blobs that kind of broke off out there. But those are actually other galaxies called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. Does anyone know where the Magellanic comes from? What does that sound like? Sorry? Magellan. Why are they called, why are they named after Magellan? Does anyone know? Guesses? Because he was the first European to go, basically travel to the southern hemisphere and name them. People living well before the time of Magellan knew about these things, right? Like anybody in the southern hemisphere before Magellan was there, down there saw them and they had names for them. But they're named after Magellan because Magellan was the first European to sort of travel to the southern hemisphere and catalog them. And then, then it, it is sort of propagated through the literature that way. That's why they're called the Magellanic Clouds. So, you know, he sort of gets credit for it, but people knew about them long, long before Magellan. We now know that they're not just clouds but they're actually other galaxies in their own right. And remember, it was the small Magellanic Cloud that Henrietta Leavitt was studying when she discovered this really fundamental variable star relation I talked about last time. So they're very important in sort of the history of astronomy. 
What's amazing is the Milky Way is not alone. That unlike stars, galaxies are not so lonely. The Milky Way actually, we now know, has about 25 little satellite galaxies that are whizzing around it. So if this is the disk in the Milky Way, about 100,000 light years across, it's got these kind of two big satellites, the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud that are orbiting around it. But there are all these other satellites, little galaxies, that are whizzing around the Milky Way too. All within a few hundred thousand light years. Which in the scheme of things, based on how big our, you know, the disk is, it's pretty close. Now every single one of these things is small. Okay, they have, some of them have only a thousand stars in them. So it's galaxies with only a thousand stars. And some of them have a billion stars, but they're still, you know, a hundred times smaller than the, than the Milky Way disk. So actually, so let me show you, this is, this is not a, an artist's impression anymore. This is a, a real picture of the Milky Way. So this is a, this is a map made of the sky in infrared light. So infrared light significant because that long wavelength infrared light can see through a lot of the galaxy. So this gives you sort of a, a clearer picture of the galaxy. And what this is, it's an all sky image of, from the Earth then pieced together on this projection, this ATOF projection. And you'll see this kind of projection used on world maps sometimes, right? You'll see world maps, the whole globe projected out on this flat 2D surface. This is the same thing. Except now, rather than looking down on the sphere of the globe, you're taking the sphere that would be the sky, looking out from it, right, and mapping it onto a flat 2D picture. So the point is that this part of the sky wraps around to this part of the sky. And you see this band cutting through the whole sky, and it's been oriented such that the Milky Way disk is right through the middle. And on this, you see here again, the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. You can see these galaxies here. But there's actually a third galaxy that you can see by eye in this picture if you squint. And it's right there. This galaxy actually wasn't discovered until the late 1990s. And the reason why, even though it's actually much, much closer to us than either of these two, and it's still pretty big, the problem is, it's basically being eaten by our galaxy. So it's plunging through the disk, and we see the tip of it sticking out on the far, far end of where the bulge is. So as, as we look through in our disk through the bul at the bulge of our galaxy, just sticking right below it is this little galaxy sticking out of there. This galaxy is called the Sagittarius galaxy. It's called the Sagittarius galaxy because you have to look through the constellation Sagittarius to see it. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions about this, what we're looking at? There's a little, it's hard to see, but there's a little smudge of light kind of poking out down here. This is a, a different image. It's a 3D map, a model of what we think this Sagittarius galaxy looks like. Now here is the main Sagittarius thing I was talking about, but you'll notice that there's this big plume of stars coming out of it from either side. What that is, is it's something called a tidal stream or a tidal tail that's being ripped out of this thing. So what we think has happened is this little galaxy has, over the last couple billion years, has been orbiting around our disk and plunged through it. And when it plunged through it, that strong gravitational field of our galaxy has ripped this other little one apart. So our big, you know, the big mean galaxy that is the Milky Way is kind of picking on these little, these little dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around it and in sometimes shredding them, shredding them up into bits. This is actually a simulation that was done. This was actually done by one of my graduate students a few years ago. And here is the Milky Way disk. And what uh, Chris was doing is he, was, he took this supercomputer simulation and modeled what happened both to the disk of the Milky Way and the Sagittarius dwarf over the last couple billion years as it tore this, gal as it tore this galaxy apart. And what you end up with is something that you know, creates this stream. This is all done basically, in order to predict this, you basically have to understand gravity. 
But once you understand gravity, you can basically do this. And it looks an incredible amount like the real data. The other thing that's kind of amazing and interesting is, as you watch this thing uh, happen, notice the disk is smooth here and it doesn't have any spiral arms. When this thing plunges through, it creates one of these spiral waves, and the spiral rays start wrapping up to create spiral structure, which is exactly like the spiral structure we see in our own galaxy. So it could be that the whole shape and overall structure of our galaxy, and not, all, not only this big plume of everything that we see coming around it, has happened because we have this galaxy that's passing through our disk and just shaking things up. Are there any questions about this? I'll just show you another movie because movies are fun. This little thing here is like the sun. We tagged it. And here's this thing coming in now. Now we colored it purple. I'm not sure why. So we think over the last couple billion years, our galaxy has been having these kind of pretty intense interactions with those little neighbors that are all around it. And there's other evidence that this kind of thing has been going on for a while. Um, this is another map of our Milky Way, but now we've backed out a little bit more. So as before, I had a bar on there that was 100,000 light years. Now that bar has stretched out another factor of 10 to a million light years. Now, right here, we've got the Milky Way, and we've got those little satellite galaxies orbiting around it. Over here is Andromeda. This is our friend Andromeda that I talked about last time. This is the thing that Edwin Hubble used. He resolved the Cepheid variable star in it, showed that it was another galaxy in its own right, and there it is. Andromeda is about the same size as the Milky Way. It's basically a twin, and it's about two and a half million light years from us. So it's another kind of... Uh, crazy disk of stars that's over here. And Andromeda also has its own little network of satellite galaxies orbiting around it. So it has its sort of, uh, you know, paparazzi orbiting around it. We've got our little paparazzi going around us. And, you know, we're sort of two superstars here, paparazzi swarming all around us. Now, uh, the reason why those little things swarm around us is we're big. And we have a lot of gravity. So the gravity of the Milky Way keeps these other little things whizzing around it, and the big gravity of Andromeda keeps all these little things whizzing around it. Now, the thing that's very different about our galaxy uh, and these little galaxies is that we're much more massive than it, but Andromeda is massive too. And in fact, what's going on is the Milky Way and Andromeda are going to slam into each other. And next time I'm going to show you a movie of that. So we think that in about four billion years, these two guys are going to come together. When we measure how fast Andromeda is moving, we can measure how fast it's moving by looking at the Doppler shift of light from it. We see that it's headed right for us. And you know, whether you think of that as us being still and, and Andromeda coming at us or us coming at each other, we're about equal mass and equal size. And in about four billion years, we're going to slam together and mix up and create a giant mess of stars. This general phenomenon, we think, is actually pretty common. Galaxies, unlike stars, live pretty close together. And they have a lot of gravity, so they're tugging on each other. And so galaxies, we actually think, are slamming together all the time. And this process we see as we look out into the universe and start setting other galaxies, we see again and again and again that galaxies often experience these great mergers with each other and toss stars all around. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Yeah. So it turns out they don't. So one of the things that's kind of amazing is Let's, let's think back again to, to what the stars look like with respect to each other. If we were a golf ball, the nearest star to us would be a marble in Clearwater, Florida. And so this vast disk of stars that in the Milky Way is basically mostly empty of stars. And it's just like little, you know, golf ball here, golf ball there, golf, golf ball there. They're separated by, it'd be like golf balls separated by thousands of miles. 
So now take a disk that looks like that, that's basically empty with a few stars here and there and throw them at each other. What happens is all those stars feel all the other stars via gravity and that's kind of what keeps them oriented to the disks and then when they slam together their orbits get scrambled and it gets all messed up. But it's very, very rare that stars will actually hit each other because there's so much space between them. So most likely there'll be some other golf balls coming from Andromeda, right, but they'll just pass in between. You know, somewhere between here and Florida there'll be another golf ball that passes by, but you know, you'll never know that. And it probably, um, it probably won't affect the orbit of the Earth very much either, so that kind of thing. One thing it might do though, which is kind of, kind of fun to think about, if you'll remember when I talked about the solar system uh, long ago, I briefly mentioned that um, you know, we have the sun, we have all the planets, and you go out to Pluto, and then well beyond that, we think that there's this kind of very diffuse, huge cloud of rocks that's called the Oort cloud that's made of comets. And those comets every now and then get triggered and they plunge in towards the sun and that's what we see these big plumes and stuff like that, like Halley's Comet, stuff like that. But these things plume are very far out. And we think that occasionally in our own galaxy, like when, a spiral, when we go through a spiral arm, this giant cloud of comets gets perturbed and shook and that allows comets to rain in on the Earth. And we think it might be that these periodic encounters with other stars and things like that and spiral arms may have actually triggered comets to, to rain in on the Earth and maybe cause mass extinctions, right? So we think it's, a lot of people think that, for example, 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct, it was perhaps a comet, that, a big comet that slammed into the Earth and caused this massive extinction event. So it could be that on those very long timescales, 100 million year timescales, that we will occasionally encounter that big extended ball of comets encounters things that releases them to rain in on the Earth and sort of affects things. So it might be that when Andromeda slams into the Earth, it will wreak havoc on this Oort cloud of comets and, you know, send stuff raining in. However, the sun probably would have boiled the oceans by then, so we don't really have to worry about that. We'll have bigger things to worry about before that happens. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. That's it for today, and we'll see you Monday.